So my work deals with building intelligent systems, and in particular robotic systems. So systems where computational intelligence is embodied in some mechanical system and can go out into the world. So specifically, we work on, for example, a robot that can swim and walk, and it moves around in the water, can swim underwater with a person, without a person, take video, understand that video to some extent, hopefully come back to the same places it's seen before and take new measurements, and in some sense build models and kind of understand the world that it's in. And so we've worked with biologists at McGill whose, whose research, their biological research, is to understand what's going on on a coral reef and how fish, fish species move around on them. The focus of my research in high energy particle theory is on how matter behaves under extreme conditions of temperature and density. So if you take ordinary matter and you pack it together so hot and so dense that the nuclei all fuse together into one continuous medium of hot stuff. Hotter than occurs in stars, more like the conditions which occurred in the first microsecond of the history of the universe, which is one of the interesting applications, and the conditions that we can achieve in laboratory by colliding two nuclei with each other. And we think that we know the theory which is supposed to describe these conditions, but that doesn't mean that we know how to successfully use the theory or calculate the behavior of this material under those conditions. The project that the Killam has uh, allowed me to pursue is um, to be the coordinator for galactic science on a new NASA mission. Uh, it's a space telescope that is being built at Caltech and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Um, it's a $165 million project. It's launching a new type of X-ray telescope. The launch date is spring 2012, and uh, I'm helping to uh, decide what targets within our own galaxy this telescope is going to study. Well, the McGill Metals Processing Center is involved with the metals industry, in particular the steel making and aluminum industries, and we work on processes, the improvement of them or the invention of new processes that uh, have green aspects to them, environmentally sustainable in the future. We have better processes that we can bring in, for instance, in strip casting compared with the conventional casting that's happening at the present time. Our mission for the UMPC is to uh, work with industry and to do fundamental and applied research, but mainly is to educate, to train our students in such a way that they can be good specialists and future workers in industry. There's a very specific moment that I knew that I wanted to study, in my case, international management, and especially the people parts of international management, cross-cultural management. How do you have human beings from around the world and organizations from around the world working together for the greater benefit of all of us? I decided to study the women who had gotten chosen and look at what led to success. So I think one of the other themes with global leadership is I've constantly been asking the question, what works, instead of what isn't working. Well, I think our research will continue at a, at a basic science level because ultimately the only answer to any medical problem is more and better basic science research that will lead to novel methods of of treatment and we have to make that our number one priority. But having said that, some of the work that our lab has carried out uh, has led to perhaps better understanding of methods of HIV transmission and as a result of that research we are now also trying to mount prevention efforts that are research oriented R right here in Montreal and, and as well in uh, developing country settings, I think our next best effort should be 
on trying to prevent numbers of transmissions and so, so certainly that has to be a focus both for us and for many other groups throughout the world. I've been looking to address those systems in the brain, the neurons in the brain and the chemicals they use which keep the brain and thus the organism, the individual, awake and vigilant to adapt and respond uh, effectively during a waking, normal waking state, which for humans is the entire light period of the day. And then conversely, how other neural systems and chemicals turn off the waking system to enforce sleep and rest, which for humans occurs during darkness at night. So going deeper and deeper into that, um, being able to use over my lifetime increasingly more powerful tools, uh, you know, it's just continually exciting. My research has always been in the area of genetics, trying to understand genetic disease. We were able to start a diagnostic service here at the Children's where we could actually inform families about their uh, risk for having children with specific disorders. Later on, when we became involved in risk factors, we actually identified some very common genetic variants which actually interact with, with your diet in terms of causing disease. So that allowed us to identify mechanisms to prevent certain kinds of disorders by modulating the intake of certain vitamins, for example. So we've identified a very common variant that's actually now being tested for worldwide in many, many different labs because it's considered to be an important predictor of birth defects, heart disease, some pregnancy complications. So there's actual practical uses of some of our discoveries. Je travaille sur le, principalement sur le rôle de la biodiversité dans le fonctionnement des écosystèmes. C'est-à-dire j'essaie de comprendre comment en perdant des espèces ou d'autres formes de diversité du vivant, on risque de bouleverser les équilibres naturels dans les les écosystèmes à petite échelle ou même à l'échelle de la biosphère dans son ensemble. Nos travaux montrent que quand on perd des espèces, euh, on a tendance à perdre euh, la stabilité du fonctionnement des écosystèmes. Donc à long terme, ça veut dire des systèmes qui sont moins productifs, qui sont plus variables. C'est fondamental à mon avis. On est dans une période de crise majeure de notre rapport à l'environnement. So my research focuses on the genetics of aging. One of the theory of aging that had been around for a long time, and the theory that has pretty much been accepted by the public, not just by scientists, was that free radicals, which are toxic compounds that are produced by our bodies, actually cause aging. And the free radicals are these compounds that are, are believed are being fought, are being combated by antioxidants. Antioxidants, you know, prevent free radicals from having their toxicity. Uh, and uh, what we've shown that this theory is probably wrong, that the free radicals do not cause aging, and therefore that maybe the use and abuse of antioxidants should be uh, uh, analyzed or at least uh, called into question. I use a technique called X-ray scattering, X-ray diffraction, and so that's how we measure the atomic structure of the materials. So over the last 20 years, 30 years, the uh, quality or the um, capability of doing x-ray scattering has increased enormously, like more than a billion times, basically because of new machines that have been designed called synchrotrons. And so that's allowed us to measure the structure of materials much faster than we could before and with much finer detail. And so it's, as a physicist, it's always nice to be able to be the first to look at things. And so the kinds of things we've been looking at are things that are not directly like tempering of steel, but related to tempering of steel. So we've done things where we would cool a material from being very hot to very cold, and it starts to undergo what's called a phase transition where the structure changes, and then we watch with the x-rays. We sort of make an x-ray movie to see how the structure changes with time. So my research is really about understanding the link between information technology and how information technology transforms organization. Uh, how we develop information technology, how we implement information technology, how people um, adapt to information technology, resist to information technology, and how we measure the benefit and the value that information technology brings. The organizations that really use it effectively are organizations that have a plan. They know 
what they're expecting and they know what benefit they want to achieve and they reorganize the way people work, they reorganize the way they're structured to really benefit from information technology. So communication, communication, communication and making sure expectations are very, very clear is, is critical. Well, we are investigating, uh, you know, kind of thing like uh, advanced uh, transmission technique and the adaptive resource allocation technique. The idea is to uh, get more bandwidth capacity for wireless communication. Before we're talking about human-to-human -human communication, now we talk more machine-to-machine -machine and we want to be uh, communication available everywhere and that get into things like the modern home with the uh, management in the home like energy in terms of alarm system in terms of safety so i think that is what uh, is uh, demanding in the uh, next 10 20 years what my research started as is really looking at uh, trying to understand primate social organization so looking at questions about why some monkeys are found all by themselves or in small groups, whereas other monkeys you can find groups of two, three hundred. Uh, so it's really amazing the variation. And what's the ecological factors kind of behind that? And then what are the kind of social ramifications of that? And now we've shifted more towards looking at the diseases and what diseases do the monkeys carry? What are their consequences in terms of their fitness, their reproduction? And how disease might jump from primates to humans. I love doing the research itself. Uh, I basically, you know, more or less launched this field that looks at second language acquisition from a Chomskyan perspective and, of, and, and that is, and, and people sort of said, oh yes, this is what we should be doing. That's very gratifying. But what I really find most gratifying is training graduate students who also, who see the value of the field and want to develop their own hypotheses and ideas within the same general context. And I've had, um, you know, over the years, more than 20 graduate students, and many of them have gone on to uh, academic university careers, several of them now full professors themselves. And that is really wonderful. The main thrust, the main line is really media arts. And, uh, um, and I, as I am a specialist of contemporary art, so it's really contemporary media arts from the 1960s to the present. How art, artistic practices, uh, integrate emerging technologies. Technologies have been, can never determine the way that we perceive the world, but they influence the way that we see the world. In what way has cinema even shaped our way of of understanding and looking at the world. Don't we, I mean, how is it to look at the world not only through the grid of cinema, but even in daily life, do we not see the world in a more cinematographic way, in a more filmic way? My area of research is early Chinese history, uh, particularly newly discovered uh, archeological documents, texts, as well as the history of science and technology in China, particularly military technology. Prior to the 19th century, there were more books published in China than anywhere else in the world put together. Very fortunately, 1972, then archaeology started again after the end of the Cultural Revolution, and enormous numbers of finds were being made. And since that time, there have been immense numbers of documents and early texts discovered. And so now we are able to completely rewrite the whole history of early China. Moi, j'enseigne la littérature française de la Renaissance et je m'intéresse plus particulièrement aux écrits des femmes du 16e siècle français et aux écrits de ceux que l'on a appelés les pré-réformateurs. Je pense à un cas en particulier, Marie de Gournay, qui était la fille d'Alliance de Montaigne. Elle a pris euh, position sur d'innombrables sujets, sur la traduction, sur l'égalité des hommes et des femmes, qui à l'époque était encore impensable. Donc, moi, ce qui m'intéresse vraiment, c'est comment cette marginalité euh, prend la parole sur la place publique.
et pourquoi et selon quelle organisation sociale, euh, selon quel facteur, dans quel but, euh, par quel financement, par quel moyen. I'm a theoretical econometrician and econometrics is by its nature an applied discipline so working as a theorist means that I develop methodology, I endeavor to show when statistical inference can be reliable and when it is less so. Where I get involved in actual applications is in the analysis of income distribution and of poverty, where I've developed with various colleagues a variety of techniques for having more reliable inference whereby you can compare income distributions in either different places at the same time or the same place at different times in order to make welfare comparisons in the various circumstances that you're looking at. The basic focus is to understand how proteins are synthesized in the cell and what's even more important, how the synthesis is controlled. If you don't control correctly the amount of proteins you make in the cells, you end up with disease and of course death. So this led us to different diseases. The, the major one that we're working on is cancer. The tremendous amount of knowledge that we have now in our hands. So of course it took, it took some time, but now the, log the, 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 no the knowledge is accumulated in a logarithmic scale. You know, every day we have more and more. So basically that's why it's not only me who, who is optimistic. Everybody is optimistic. That Based on that, we can find uh, a way, you know, to, to uh, cure cancer or to stabilize it. I was invited to practice, uh, develop a pediatric clinic in a community hospital, the Montreal Chinese Hospital. I observed the difference of health care uh, accessibility and also the uh, knowledge about health maintenance among immigrant groups seem to be uh, suboptimal. And I noticed that iron deficiency anemia is so prevalent. And then the breastfeeding rate was only 8% among Chinese. You see that the, this target population group's uh, health maintenance behavior as well as knowledge in nutrition and, uh, and how to get to uh, medical services, they, their standard had increased over the years. And that's a very gratifying issue. Much of my research was, uh, major research was on menopause in the earlier years. And it was a comparative study between Japan and North America. The surprise finding was that it wasn't merely cultural differences that was at work, but that there were very profound and extraordinarily interesting biological differences at work as well. And since that time, most of my research has focused in one way or another on the entanglement and the interrelationship of biology with culture. So I um, sort of broke through the nature-nurture debate to think about things in a new way. It's not a question of either nature or nurture, but these things are in effect, inseparable and need to be understood as interacting with each other. Well, in Alzheimer's, uh, what uh, we have made uh, some emphasis is the role of the very early pathology, in particular the events uh, that take place uh, in relation to the early accumulation of the toxic uh, so-called beta amyloid peptide within cells in an intracellular fashion as opposed uh, to plaque formation. Uh, I'm in a group of uh, optimistic and believe that uh, in not a distant future we will find uh, uh, reliable markers uh, that uh, can anticipate uh, the conversion of uh, a normal aging to what is called mild cognitive impairment, uh, which is uh, the threshold state uh, to actual clinical Alzheimer's disease with a dementia component. Well, I've been doing research in the area of deafness and disability for over 40 years. 
they really need sign language access to access health services, employment services, social services, etc. And it's been very difficult. We've had a shortage of sign language interpreters all over the country. We showed that using video conferencing technology, you could overcome that barrier in that the deaf person and the physician or the health service provider could be in one place and the interpreter could be somewhere else. That could be implemented right now over commercial internet at very little cost, yet for some reason or other we can't seem to get that done. That's a attitudinal barrier. That's something that could happen tomorrow that would drastically change the life of deaf people. I've been working on hypertension, high blood pressure, in both experimental animals and in humans over the past uh, 35 years. And uh, what we are interested in are the mechanisms underlying the rise in blood pressure, and especially the renin angiotensin system, aldosterone, endothelin. These are all uh, agents that uh, produce elevation of blood pressure and that control the uh, elimination of sodium from the body, sodium and water and as a result contribute to blood pressure elevation. We have defined professionalism uh, so that it is teachable uh, and that one can be explicit uh, as opposed to what was previously fairly fuzzy. Honesty, integrity, competence, uh, caring and compassion, uh, insight into how you're reacting to the patient and the patient is reacting to their own illness. Uh, being open to people di being different, that they have an autonomy, that it's a partnership, not a, not a dictatorship, if you will, in the relationship. And most importantly, to realize that we don't heal the patient. The patient heals themselves. Uh, we just facilitate that by the various things that we can do. The Health Technology Assessment Unit receives requests from the hospital for advice as to whether they should or should not buy new technologies which are not yet on the market. And um, it, it considers the advice, it analyzes the, the benefit and the harm and the cost, and it recommends to the hospital whether it should or should not make that purchase. The best you can do is work with good evidence, clean scientific evidence, unbiased, uh, that the decisions should be taken by informed, unbiased people. And third, that it should be transparent. Les nouvelles morbidités sont beaucoup d'ordre, en fait, qui touchent le développement de l'enfant euh, et euh, souvent associées à des causes sociales. Et en pédiatrie, on n'était pas vraiment équipé pour faire face à ce type de morbidité qui qui nuit énormément aux enfants, tant dans, dans, dans leur cheminement de vie, de leur réussite scolaire, de leur qualité de vie aussi. Et euh, je voulais une approche qui, qui soit très, très près des gens, où, où on mobilise davantage les communautés et les familles. Maintenant, on est rendu une dizaine de centres de pédiatrie sociale en communauté au Québec, où les universités participent avec des stages de résidents en, en pédiatrie et en médecine familiale. Et c'est devenu un concept, une approche qui, euh, qui est une approche très globale, très proximale euh, et euh, très intensive aussi euh, par rapport à, au suivi d'une trajectoire d'enfant. If we can understand the nature of matter at ultra high densities, densities 10, maybe a hundred times greater than in an atomic nucleus. Uh, maybe in 400 years we'll be driving cars that are powered by a, a pin-sized pellet of matter for, you know, uh, 20 years. And you don't need gasoline, nice clean energy. You know, you, I obviously can't guarantee that sort of thing, but who knows? You know, you would never have anticipated the iPhone from Michael Faraday 200 years ago playing with little bits of metal and working out the basics of electromagnetism. You, who, could, who could guess you'd have a Kindle out of that? For many years I've been interested in if nerve cells had the capacity to grow again. With advancements in science, it's been possible to begin to tackle this question and 
we've been working for years on this issue, as well as many other labs in different parts of the world. And it turns out that the nerve cells retain the capacity to grow, so they could do it. But something is preventing them from doing it. And if we could unleash that capacity, certainly there are some hopes that these fibers could again reach their partners and restore function.